Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Alright guys, comic book we're going to talk about is one I've been like watching a lot of Law & Order on Netflix and stuff getting ready for. It's a series that came out in, back in uh, I think 2000 and the first volume was under Image and ran until 2004. Um, and um, I finally got the first two issues off the of eBay. These were really beginning to drive me nuts. But we're going to be talking about Powers uh, by Brian Michael Bendis and uh, Michael Avon Oming. Okay? first series ran for 37 issues from 2000 to 2004 and the thing really became a phenomenon there for a little bit because it was an award-winning title. Um, uh, Brian Bendis was starting to take off at Marvel uh, at the same time that he kept powers going. Avon Emming came in because people were talking about he had a Bruce Timms kind of style yet, you know, I, the way I remember it, kids didn't really get into it. It was wild. And as you read it, you saw it was a lot darker and not quite the same thing. Um, also, like, the, my memory of it is um, I had number one in my hand and did not get it. I thought it was another title coming back from the 80s that I remember called uh, Secret Silent Invasion. And uh, it wasn't. You know, I didn't remember what the title was in the 80s, but, you know, I thought it was like uh, set in the 50s because when you look at the cover of it, the guy's in a suit. Uh, Film and War kind of makes the uh, city a character in itself. That's a, you know... I was thinking this was it. Started flipping through, and I'm like, well, "What is this?" And I put it back. Lo and behold, a few months later, it's all over the place. And everybody's talking about it. And I remember watching some reality shows when they were starting in the early 2000s. Me, you know, uh, and uh, seeing how like uh, you had like Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, where they were in New York and they were redoing this guy's uh, apartment and stuff for him. You know, trying to you know shoosh him a little bit so that he could uh, uh, you know start dating again or something one of the things they did was the interior decorating his apartment and they figured out where to put his comic books they found these little wicker baskets that would hide it and the first thing they did was pick up a great big huge stack of powers and i was just like it's, it's everywhere all right so anyway with that said powers is basically um returning the crime comics to a certain extent okay there was sort of a um of a uh first of all crime comics I tried to pull a Comic Girl 19 on you guys and looked up on Wikipedia and all this stuff and, and I was reading this stuff and I was like, I don't need to do this, okay? Crime comics, comic historians try to say that crime comics started around 1942 with a, and, and there's a long running title in the 40s called Crime Does Not Pay. EC Comics had a bunch of crime comics that were outstanding, okay? And they were actually so outstanding and so violent and supposedly this and supposedly that, women victimized and everything like that, that when the Senate hearings came up, it was some of those crime comics from EC that they brought up, like the girl with the decapitated head and the man standing there with an axe in his hand, bloody axe in his hand. Um, and technically, they don't really show a decapitated head because they just show it from here down with her eyes rolled back and him holding her by her hair. It's open interpretation. But anyway... With the 50 Senate hearings that sat there and, and uh, went back and forth with, um, you know, are, are, are we, uh, the Wortham was the psychologist who was trying to say that, you know, comics made juvenile delinquents, it influenced our kids bad, and it brought up all these moral issues and stuff like that. You know, it, it not only did that kill the horror comics, all, you know, almost completely out of there instead of the Comics Code Authority, but it also killed crime comics. They're kind of overlooked. So... But the problem I have with what I found on Wikipedia and with a little bit of what I read and stuff is that I, I refuse to give a date to crime comics saying that it, they started in 1942 because, you got to understand, in 1937 we had a book come out called Detective Comics and in Detective Comics number one there was no Batman, okay? This is a year before Superman, this is almost two years before Batman. Detective Comics were about you know, crime. You had uh, Slam Bradley, um, Speed Saunders. There was uh, seems like there was a um, seems like there was an Asian um, 
story in that first issue. I've only read it in reprint, of course, you know, and stuff like that. And those were sort of influenced by Dick Tracy of the early 30s and the, you know, and the uh, comic strip, you know, in the papers and stuff. So, I don't know a whole lot about crime comics. I just know that they've kind of been there. In the 80s, I remember a Dakota North private investigator miniseries, and then uh, it seems like they had a little here, the cops, the, I remember the cops being in uh, some of the stories and stuff. I always felt like they were trying to give them a film noir feel. But then you had Sin City come out by Frank Miller at Dark Horse Comics. And bam, holy cow, man. That was it. Film noir was back. I also kind of considered the spirit a crime comic. Uh, the Will Eisner, but, you know, that's another video. So basically what was going on is, uh, I'm not saying that Frank Miller started the resurgence of crime comics. That's arguable. Okay, we're where, where that's, that's 23 years ago that it came out, I think, 22, 23 years ago that it came out. But what happened after that is that we had a bunch of uh, writers coming in. Uh, some of them were already uh, successful journal, you know, novelists. I think somebody was a journalist. You had uh, Bendis here who was trying to make scripts in Hollywood and everything like that. And they came in and we had books like Whiteout and Torso and Jinx and stuff, all right? And... Uh, you know, these guys were coming in, Greg Ruka was one of them, Brian Azzarello, you know. And then all of a sudden, crime comics were kind of on the uprise in the independent scene, man. And, and you know, coming out of the image stuff. And Marvel buying up all the companies like um, like Malibu and uh, their Ultraverse. And, and, like, Marvel sitting there, like, uh, taking on Defiant Comics, you know, uh, for copyright issues. Even though they were, you know, Defiant Comics beat Marvel in court. It took out all their money and stuff, right? So all of a sudden, man, it's like just the indie market was kind of, you know, all, your alternative companies and stuff were kind of laid out and stuff, you know. But Image was still going, man, and all of a sudden, man, you had like powers. Because some of those indie books were starting to win awards, you know, White Out and Torso, excellent read and stuff, right? But then Bendis came out with this. All right, powers, okay? This is Law and Order SVU. That's what I compare it to, okay? You have uh, Christian Walker and... Uh, Oh man, I'm forgetting the names of them. Let me check my note here. I'm tired. All right, you have Christian Walker and Dina Pilgrim, right? And uh, basically, they are the homicide division. Oh man, come on, camera. They are the uh, they, they're they're cops. They're just outright detectives, right? Christian Walker, our main guy, has been around for you know a while and actually becomes part of a subplot going on through the story. And then he gets this uh, rookie detective comes in. Bowl cutted blonde, real real tiny woman, uh, Dina Walker, who comes in, and uh, you know all of a sudden it's like Law and Order. But what they do is is that even though I consider this a crime comic, what they do is that they investigate uh, homicides that involve powers, superpowers, death of heroes, villains, and stuff like that that goes on. They had a couple arcs. All right, so just to show you what's going on here. This is the stuff that I personally feel that Michael Bendis, this is his strength in writing, okay? The talking heads, the, uh, the, uh, he has a way of, like, the pacing in his books, I mean, it just, they, it's like they move, right? One of the first books uh, that he wrote that I have, and may be his first comic, Jinx, the first, I don't know, four or five pages are nothing but a dollar falling, you know, before it hits the ground over pages and pages. So this book works in arts, okay? So first of all, we get this big film noir style, right? One of the rules of film noir is you make the city a character. And even though I don't think they actually made the city a character, they definitely made made it uh, set a mood and stuff, right? That's definitely film noir when I see it, man. We open right up and it's like any great uh, detective movie, detective uh, TV show, man. We got the tape, we got the crime scene, we got the cops there holding back the crowd. You know, y'all automatically you're just right in there. Okay? And, uh, you know, you just kind of follow Walker around while he's talking to the case and stuff. And then you start picking up that something's different here. Okay? You start to finally hear how they're talking. And then uh, you finally, you know, he has the little girl that he's taking care of is at the crime scene. You find out that it's, uh, we start building up to the death of Retro Girl, who was one of them. You start looking at the people who are in the uh, dirty, nasty um, police station with the detectives and stuff. You start noticing they have masks. You know, and you start, you, you're getting introduced into this world, man. And it's like, just take law and order, basically, and uh, there you go. You have you have the detectives and stuff. Anyway, so here's 
Dean of Pilgrim or Blonde, and this is like I said, this is where his dialogue is so. Ex I mean, Bendis's dialogue in in these books are just spot on. I mean, they're just spot on. They're just great. The Talking Heads work on this. They're exchanging information, and every now when things get too heavy, he he kind of this is the humor that he can work on. He's kind of witty. I don't think Bendis can write humor, which kind of cracks me up because he's an Ultimate Spider-Man for so long and stuff. Because it's just. I don't know, he just it just doesn't flow, it doesn't feel like it's right coming from him, but when he talks about cops cracking jokes and being in silly situations, you know, it's funny, because they're trying to get out of being a case, Walker's trying to get out of having a partner, you know, and it's light and stuff. So they go on, and right there we go, that's the iconic page that was used over and over and over in Powers, okay, we got our hero at the crime scene dead, and that's the first mystery. And uh, even when uh, the book took off and Oni Press had Madman and stuff like that, uh, this is where Bendis came in and wrote kind of a parody of um, Powers, uh, Oni Press special. So it was getting around and stuff. And when Powers was, you know, sort of taken off, man, it was kind of like, okay, now we know what this world is. It's more or less the real world. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, there's a times where there's a touch of Watchmen feel in there, where it's, you know, you get that it's a real world, the way these characters act, and I'll get into that in a minute. One of the specials that came out back then is that this would be like the uh, coloring activity books they used to give you out in school if they they used to do in my day. But for that stuff, it was kind of like what to do in a fire, how to call 911, and all this stuff. And uh, they came out with this. But what it is is that they they went straight to it, man. They they th this is not tongue in cheek. This is actually a guide on what you would do if you lived in a world of powers and you wanted your kid to have safety, man. It looks just like it would be. So it feels like you got something really out of this world pulled out and handed to you and this is something you'd get as a kid when you were there the powers color and activity book um, for example if you remember these stuff safety tips for kids I state your name promise to try to be you know observe safety everywhere and then it tells you what to do if you see a superhero fight going on you know it even has activities in here you know, if there's an emergency, you want to dial 911, talk to the operator, and you let the fire, firemen, the paramedics, and the police officers take up things. Don't hang up before the operators, you know, pull through. And then there's like, there's a lot of jabs or inspiration from the old Superman books going through powers, the situations. Okay, back in the 50s, there's supposedly reports of kids putting towels on their neck and jumping off the roof of their houses because of the Superman TV show with George Reeves. And this tells you not to do it. You know, it also tells you don't do the other stupid things that, you know, kids want to do. And you think when you see your favorite superhero, you'd want to run up and meet them and stuff. You know, because they're all American. No, you're going to end up, like, getting burned and stuff or something horrible is going to happen because these idiots can't handle their powers or their radiation. They have radiation. They don't know it. Or it's a villain in disguise. They're still strangers just because they have a mask. Don't run up to them. They're still strangers. So, you know, you kind of you get that. Okay. And like I said, the thing became so popular that uh, we ended up getting a half issue from Wizards you had to order. And, yeah, I ordered three back in the day. They were cheap, but I got me three. And they all come with certificates of authenticity for your powers. Which I thought was, you know. So, anyway, the book, the book took off. And I ended up, like, scrambling. Three or four months after it, the first issue shot up in value. And I was like, oh, no. Oh no! You know, at this point in time, I've, I've been collecting comics probably creeping up on 23, 24 years, and I'm like, I missed a big number one that went up to golf. So I ended up uh, picking up with issue six, with issue seven, is what happened by the time I got back to a comic shop back then. So anyway, these these books work in arcs a lot better to get the full story. They got a subplot where you gotta understand what I liked about it is uh, they kind of take a jab there on like some of the Superman stuff. I, I saw a lot of the Superman situations in here, okay? And, and it's Lois Lane, Lana Lane trying to figure out Superman's secret identity. Well, in this one, you find out that Christian Walker used to be a superhero, but does he have his powers? And it's not common knowledge there, but he's working with detectives. And that's the thing about Superman. How could he hide a secret identity with a pair of glasses when he was working with a bunch of journalists who's, you know, a whole idea is to do this. How could Batman get away with keeping a secret identity when he's always working with the cops like Jim Gordon and stuff, you know, and stuff like that? Well, they, they do that. And the first thing, one of the first thing that happens is, you know, Christian Walker is sitting there talking to her, to his partner, uh, Dina, 
And she's just flat out asking them, or do you have power? Should you just be a superhero? And she catches him off guard and kicks him right in the gut, and he goes down. And she, he's like, what the hell are you doing? Uh, you know. And all of a sudden, you find she, we're, we're right there with her. And I like those characters. I like that story structure where you always have that one character that helps you walk out into this comic book universe. And you're seeing these characters through their eyes and the situations through their eyes. And that's us. They're, they're there to be the, the, the you know, guide for the reader, the reader's eyes. This is the person that things would get explained to. You know why Doctor Two, Who has companions? So Doctor Who has somebody to explain things to, thus making it not sound corny when they're talking to the viewers. And that's kind of what she is. You know, her thoughts and suspicions and stuff come up there. All right. So anyway, they're, 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 you find out that, uh, you, you slowly start finding out that um, the way the heroes, they go around, and it's so cool because, like, they go around and they question people. They question heroes. They're there, and it's like all pure detective. It's this this guy leading to this guy leading to this guy, and you start seeing that our right, Christian knows all these people. He's real familiar with them, which just sets her off trying to figure out more and more. And plus, she's a good cop, you know. Um, and then all of a sudden, they take a break, and you start finding out that you get your first taste of what's going on here. Uh, basically, what it is is that when I saw this, one of the themes going through this was celebrity. Okay, because the first issue I got had Warren Ellis in it, and uh, Warren Ellis was a guest star. He wanted to be a writer who got permit. He was a writer who got permission to ride along with cops, and our two great detectives were picked, so he could hear the dialogue and see how they work and add that grit and that you know make it more real in his writing and stuff. And he's actually got a big speech in here that I've used before about what the experience of reading a comic book. How you can take one comic book. And it's an introverted medium. You sit down by yourself and you read it, but at the same time, without people, whoever has that comic book, you're sharing that same experience with them without your bodies being there. And then years later, and this is where I took off from it, what I picked up is that well, we're having those same experiences. That's why comic book people can get together and get along and have something to talk about because you go back and you talk about books they read. You could talk to a guy who is... 56 years old, but he was 16 reading an Avengers book from 1973, and you can buy a back issue now and read it, and you can be whatever age, and if you met that person, you two would be talking about the same experience. It's kind of cool. But see, this is where I thought the theme was about celebrity, okay? And I was kind of close, and I still think that's what it is. But what it is, what it turned out is that um, what, he, what Bendis told us later is that it was about rock and roll. He kind of based Retro Girl sort of on like Janis Joplin, and these arcs sort of had rock and roll themes. It's kind of like the band was the band back in the day, and now we get, uh, we, we see what happened to him 30 years later. We see all the things that kind of come, all the temptations that come with being a rock star. I read it as celebrity, okay? That's where we come to the next one, a brand new role play. And I think role play, I want to check my notes here just to be sure. Role play, they investigate a murder on a college campus. All the victims belong to a role playing club, which they dressed up as superheroes, and evidence suggests the killings were performed by notorious villains. Okay, anyway. But uh, this is where I uh, really started to pick up that it was more of a rock and roll thing because if you look at, start looking at these covers, there's clues. Okay? You see, it's a homicide, and it's still grit and gritty, and it still has that film to war feel, and it still has that law and order feel that goes all the way through there, and you still got, you're still watching Christian. Uh, interview and question like some villains that know who he is and some uh, you know like right there's uh, we get we have uh, Diamond you kind of find out that's who Christian Walker was over here you have Trip Hammer and uh, I think that's Zarda here but if you look at this this looks like uh, Janis Joplin's record cover uh, that Robert Crumb did and I don't want to spoil the end of Retro Girl who killed Retro Girl but it's a play on the rock and roll thing that was actually the first clue because I thought it was kind of funny he actually looks like a dead rock star and when you see who killed retro girl and hear him talk you'll see how he flipped that and then there's the Beatles a big Beatle influence on some of these covers and this is where it's all starting to come out and they're doing the investigation and what's cool about the way they get people into the interrogation rooms is that somebody I think it was Trip Hammer has invented a, a light some kind of light they put up there and it gives like a green glow and it's a dampener. It, it kills powers. Once you're in that room, you don't have powers anymore. Um, oh, I'm trying to think what this is. Anyway, that's that's kind of like a rock and roll album, too. That's number uh, 10. I'm trying to think which one it is. I keep thinking Brian Adams for some reason. That's wrong. I don't know. It'll come to me. 
And then this, I think this is inspired by the White Album. I'm not sure if I did research, I would do it. So it's it's kind of like if you're a superhero, and this is what I like about the book. And they take this is where the jabs from Superman come from. If you're a superhero, and uh, you know you're saving a bunch of kids, all of a sudden you have groupies. Okay, you have groupies, and you're popular and stuff. And while you're sitting there saving these kids, and you're in the suburbs, and you got three kids, and you just put out a fire, and everybody's clapping you, and you got like the 50 scene. All of a sudden, you look up, you know, 50 scene with the cop right now through his report, and everybody's happy and clapping for you. But if you look in the crowd, man, there's some big booby blonde sitting there just looking at you like a groupie on stage. Well, anyway, they play along with it, and the books keep on going. You got Olympia comes clean. And we start playing around a little bit more with uh, celebrity and with detectives and stuff because they start looking like tabloids and uh, entertainment um, uh, books, you know, with the covers and stuff. They're playing with them. And just because this is going on, like I said, this is a great series to get, especially the first one. Award winning, uh, tension filled. It's got some of those cop moments where you're just like, oh my God. And like I said, read them in arcs because what happens is, is that what happens when a character like Superman ends up having Alzheimer's, okay? What happens when uh, your past catches up with you? What happens when you're famous and you're no longer famous? What happens when people start emulating you and you find that they find out you have uh, feet of clay? It kind of plays with those things, man. It's, it keeps it, you know, all of a sudden, you know, he used to be diamond. He used to have all these powers, but he can't remember a whole lot of stuff with uh, Christian Walker is what we find out. He misses Retro Girl, you find out. And you have a punk rock story, people inspired by the death of, uh, of uh, Retro Girl. He keeps going back to Retro, retro Girl, who always gets me. Chaotic chick pops up, you know. All of a sudden, you got people emulating uh, the whole idea of rock stars being dead. This is like his punk rock story. It gets get better and better. And the only reason I'm like not going on and on is that we're 20 minutes on, so I'm just going to show you the covers here and uh, keep the cop thing going. Then all of a sudden, you know, we get a little Super Friends thing. We see the team that uh, Christian Walker's dime used to be a part of in the 80s and stuff and start uh, understanding how celebrity and fame is fleeting and stuff and what happens when you you were famous and you're no longer famous. And, you know, they play with that a lot. Here's a, I think that's Bruce Springsteen inspired. And all of a sudden, you know, something terrible happens with our um, with our heroes. What I liked about this is that the fact that Superman is married, it's not super, it's a Superman type character, is married to a brunette. But all of a sudden these redheads have become up dying. And they go back and they kind of find out that uh, uh, the Fortress of Solitude looks just awesome in uh, Christian Walker's eyes. The Dean of Pilgrim being a woman and stuff looks like this isn't a, this isn't his superhero headquarters. This is where he hides from his wife, and he kind of gives you the idea that he's been longing for Lana Lang, the redhead. You know, there's little nods like that. So all of a sudden, there's this big grandioso ending to this story arc here, where uh, powers finally become just officially outlawed because he goes nuts, burns down a city in Utah, burns down the Vatican, and it's Superman basically who's had enough of the hypocrisy. So since hitting the news back then was the priest, you know, allegedly, uh, I'm being real careful here, um, you know, molesting little boys and stuff like that, he takes out the Vatican. He problem solved. He takes out stuff in the Middle East. Nobody will be starting a war there. And he just goes nuts. And he grabs Dina Pilgrim and he takes her up in the atmosphere and stuff, has this big talk with her, man, which to me was kind of like Silence of the Lambs, you know, with Hannibal talking to Clarice. So then all of a sudden a brand new story arc starts in 31 and we get the entire origin of our boy, you know, Christian Walker. Turns out he's an immortal. And he's lived many lifetimes, but his brain will only hold as much knowledge as uh, uh, a lifetime will allow. So like, let's say he can remember maybe 80 years. And also the memory started getting replaced with this new life. So he's forgotten everything that he's ever been through. He started out as a K-man. We have our bearing issues. He, you know, we have a story where he ends up in the ancient Orient and climbs a mountain to learn spiritualness and stuff. You know, but he's forgetting all this. Every lifetime, he just, his brain just can't handle it. So it kind of start, it kind of starts all over. And he's a big hero in the 30s. And then we see him being an out-and-out -out superhero in the 80s. And that's where we pick up at.
So it's a great series to get. But like I said, I recommend you read them in arcs. I recommend that um, you just have some fun with them. And it's one of my favorite series. Now, it's got Volume 1 from 2000 to 2004 was that uh, image. And then they had a Powers Volume 2 that came out. Now, I want to say that ran like 28 issues or something. Look it up. And that ran at, uh, at Icon. Marvel grabbed him up. You know, he was writing and starting writing all the Avengers book and stuff that year. And they created Icon, which is their own creator owned. They're, it's Marvel's creator owned. It's, instead of bringing back Epic, they started Icon. These are creator owned books that Marvel's publishing. They keep him under their umbrella and stuff. And that ran. And then uh, Volume 3 came out a few years later. And I think that only ran like 11 issues. And now it's back now with Powers Bureau. So this thing's been going on and on, and I just showed you the image years. Anyway, this book was real influential. It led to Bendis being able to write Elias. Bendis kind of took off there for a while, and this is kind of why I feel this is Bendis' strength. Anyway, that's Powers for you. Hope you had fun with it. I know I want to think about 20 other things I wanted to say, but you've hung with me this far. I think enough is enough. Later, guys.